we all have vulnerabilities and weaknesses that somebody can exploit. Where's Jan? Very sorry, Mom. Karen? I'm so sorry. Karen, look at me. Where is Jan? I think all of us have known narcissists and psychopaths and people who we trust who take advantage of us. The kind of loss of innocence that's depicted in this story is a particularly horrific one. Oh, where's Dan? <laughs> My name is Nick Antosca. I'm the writer, creator, showrunner of A Friend of the Family. Hop, two, three, four. A Friend of the Family is based on the true story of the Broberg family, whose daughter Jan was kidnapped multiple times in the 1970s by the same person. You know what? You just call me B. It's easier than Brother Birch told, and, uh, and the kids too. To me, this is a psychological horror show. Um, this is a show about a, a very normal family who encounter uh, a monster wearing the face of someone they love and trust. I am here to escort a young lady to a piano lesson and then to ride a horse. I wasn't expecting you, B. I think there's been a misunderstanding. Thought I heard your voice. Yeah, you thought right. How was school? Pretty good. What happened to the Brobergs is a slow burn. Um, and so in order for the audience to experience it along with them, the show needs to be a slow burn too. You know, if you try and tell this story dramatized in 90 minutes or two hours, the big events are so momentous and so shocking. It's like whiplash, uh, but this happened over six years. So, there was time for normalcy to seep back in and for people to kind of get comfortable and for them to feel safe. You come home and you go to school and you go to bed and just all these normal things are going on. It's, it's not like one thing after another. Um, they, they were able to get back into the rhythm of their lives and we wanted the show to capture the sense of normalcy and also the sense of waiting and the sense of dread. Um, that's one reason it was so valuable to have nine episodes to tell it. Good night, Marianne. We all have vulnerabilities and weaknesses that somebody can exploit. And, and it's easier to take advantage of those weaknesses than you might think. And I wanted to better understand how that happened in this case. And I wanted to understand what it felt like to live through this experience over all those years. It's gonna be a great day. I think all of us have known people who we trust who take advantage of us or who turn out to be not the person who we thought they were. While this story initially seems like it might not be so relatable, I think it really is relatable. I think everybody can relate to that. And it's a matter of degree and a matter of scope. Where's Danny? More people than you want to think have experiences with sexual abuse or grooming, or they know somebody who does. And I think the story is very, very relevant. I made him promise to be home by 6.30. Where are they? Your allergy pill. Look, I can take it without water. I think that when a lot of people saw the documentary, Abducted in Plain Sight. It was easy for them to judge the Brobergs. That's the easy reaction to have to hearing this story. You kind of can't comprehend how this guy was able to do the things that he did to this family and how they made some of the decisions that they made. But when you understand the, the texture of their lives and the context in which it happened, and the fact that like 95% of what was going on in their lives was like normal and safe. Um, and only 5% was suspicious and dangerous. And that's how he kind of crept in and insinuated himself. You start to understand how like the frog was slowly boiled proverbially. They let all these things kind of slip by until they were so deep that they couldn't get out. 
You know, the Brobergs made, as they say, every mistake in the book. They weren't stupid. Um, they lived in a time when their whole community was about forgiveness and trust and love and family and brotherhood. And those are the values that this man, this predator, exploited to take their child. When you understand the context, you can understand how this came to, to be. I just want to be worthy of your respect, Brobert, yours and Mary Ann. Oh, but you are. You are worthy. I mean, every man has worth in the eyes of the Lord. The kind of loss of innocence that's depicted in this story is a particularly horrific one. There's also a loss of innocence for the parents. I mean, everybody in this story, except for B, is an innocent at the beginning. And the story of their lives from 1972 to 1978 is a story of going from innocence to a tragic kind of experience. And a wisdom and a knowledge in the sense that trust has to be earned. And it will go out in public that you are a sinful man with unnatural desires. I've been unfaithful to you. I've been unfaithful to you. With me. We developed the look of the show and the cinematic feel of the show um, with Eliza Hittman, who directed the pilot, and all the other directors, but Eliza really set the look. And we always wanted it to feel authentically 70s without feeling like a nostalgia piece. Um, so we looked at films from the time that felt real, but still kind of felt modern. Um, specifically, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, Badlands, The Sugarland Express. Those were some of our cinematic reference points and inspirations. Jan Broberg was involved in the show from day one. As a producer on the show, and she was a consultant, um, she was always present and available. We called her after we had seen the documentary and read her book, which was what made me feel like it was incredibly rich, dramatic material that deserved nine episodes and an immersive kind of serialized experience. Um, and from that day on, we talked to Jan constantly. She came to the writer's room. Uh, we went to visit her in person. Um, she was on set. She read all the scripts. We sent her the episodes. We went to visit Jan and stayed with her. Uh, we attended Mormon services. Um, we were able to learn about their community. Uh, we wanted to portray them faithfully and respectfully. We also had a Mormon writer on the show and a Mormon consultant on set. And Jan would always go through the scripts and tell us uh, this would be phrased a little bit differently. This would be phrased like this. She was incredibly generous with her story because she wanted to create awareness about things like this happening to people still today. And uh, she wanted people to know that her family weren't so different. They weren't foolish, uh, they weren't stupid. They loved their kids and they were taken advantage of by a master manipulator. So we would talk to her about what their day-to-day -day life was like, talk to her like what music they listened to, what they ate for breakfast, what were some phrases that their parents would use and their nicknames for each other. And we tried to incorporate all that into the show so that when you're watching it, you really have a feeling of context in which this guy was able to insinuate himself. And like when they are looking at the newspaper, you know, she sees a headline that says, uh, woman sees heavy breathing UFO. That is actually a real headline from the newspaper at the time that she looked at. Um, and there's all these little details in the show that are real things that we um, replicated. A lot of the dialogue is uh, taken from actual transcripts of phone conversations or court transcripts. So we tried to avoid making it melodramatic, uh, making it uh, feel like a caricature by being as truthful as possible. It's a real family and Jan is still alive. I mean, she's, she's a producer on the show. She was present. Um, 
Jan's collaboration made it possible to be authentic to a, a degree that it never would have otherwise. So Jan and her family gave us their childhood diaries, like the actual diaries. Um, they gave us clothes that they wore. They gave us furniture from their house. They gave us thousands of photographs. They gave us recordings that they had made of their own family, of B, the predator. We wanted to portray them faithfully and respectfully and capture the texture and fabric of their lives. And he sees these two lights moving across the field. Not headlights. They were going too fast. You ever seen a thing like that, Jan? Well, never say never. One of our biggest fears going into the show and telling the story was verging on anything gratuitous or exploitative. The story was about what people didn't see. It's about how they didn't see. But I will never let Bob Birch told anywhere near me or my family ever again. For that reason, we were never going to portray sexual abuse on screen and we're never gonna ask actors to perform scenes that might be traumatic or triggering. Oddly enough, it has, there, there's light at the end of the tunnel. At the end of the story, you know, the family survived. And one of the most important things I think about the story and one of the things we talked about in the writer's room all the time is that the same values that allowed them to be exploited um, also helped them survive. My intention is not to tell a story that says, don't trust anyone and live your life in paranoia. Just listen to your instincts. Gotta head back to the store for the afternoon. I'll see you tonight. We can't tell anyone, anyone about Seda or Sethra or their people. Do you understand? I think there are a lot of things that viewers can learn from the show. I mean, one is to to be vigilant and as Jan says, you know, listen to the the first voice in your head that says, um, something seems off about this, as opposed to the second voice, which says, no, no, it couldn't possibly be. You know, it's easy to judge people. It's harder, but more important to understand what they went through and how something that seems unthinkable could have happened. I think when, whenever you're telling a true story, and this story in particular, I think it's really important to bring your empathy to it and, um, and, and to understand what it really felt like to live it. And uh, as a writer, as, a, as an audience member, as an actor, um, we always, I think, need to, to bring your empathy. Did it fly or just uh, give you a little beak? Give me a little beak. Even when you are portraying a person who does evil things, you have to look at them as a human being when you sit down to write them on the page. Um, it doesn't mean you have to have sympathy for them, but uh, empathy is the muscle that you have to use as a writer, and I think probably as an actor, um, as any sort of creative person when you're telling a story and trying to create a believable character. The degree to which you get seduced as a viewer by B is a testament to A, how seductive and charming he really was, because everything that we've written and portrayed is something that he did and something that happened, um, and a testament to Jake Lacey's performance, because he's so charming, he's so likable, um, and he's so authentic in his, his portrayal. Even if you know that he's a monster, you still feel his intentionality. You feel him, you feel that he wants what he wants. Um, and he, is so good at constructing the mask that he almost feels relatable if you forget what it is he wants and then you remember he's a monster. Um, in terms of the writer's room or the conversations with Jake, there's no attempt to make him sympathetic. Um, he is a sociopath 
and a pedophile and uh in the sense that you know evil is as evil does he's evil um i don't believe in black and white evil but he's about as close to evil as you can you can get the family has been part of the process from the beginning and so it was really um scary to show it to them for the first time um, and it was tremendously tremendously gratifying huge relief that they were proud of it they felt that we had we had captured their lives and their experience when jan watched the show uh, that was a, a really meaningful moment for me for us she grabbed my hand and um said you know it's okay it's it, it it's it's good, like a little way into it. And uh, when we finished, uh, my heart was beating and uh, we gave each other a hug. And um, I felt like, you know, we had, uh, we had done what we set out to do. For her to recognize her childhood and her experience and her family in what we had put on screen. So glad you're home.